call your attention in these few moments to a passage of scripture that is very familiar, found in uh, the gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 23. And there in the 23rd chapter in the 34th verse, uh, you'll find these words. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I want to put a tag on this text, and for a few moments with your prayers, I'd like to use as a subject from which to preach, it's above me now. It's above me now. How do you forgive people who you know are stabbing you in the back, but they always are all up in your face? How do you forgive people when you know good and well they have thrown dirt, hid their hand, but want to act like they're clean when they are around you and people they know like you? Please tell me, how do you keep from becoming bitter and resentful as you look at people who appear to be happy knowing that you have been hurt by some of the dirt they have thrown in your life? The question I'm raising right now is how is it that you can remain, don't miss this, holy and filled with joy and forgiveness knowing that someone who is always in your space and in your face has not only, don't miss this, personally hurt you, but to make matters worse, they publicly shamed you. It was bad enough that they hurt you personally, but now to magnify your misery, you've got to deal with the reality that other people know what they did to you, how they did it to you. So it's not just, here it is, the personal pain, it's the public shame. Preach, Freddie Haynes, I'm about to do that. I'll go ahead and testify since you're sitting there looking at me like you've never had anyone hurt you or break your heart. So let me transparently testify. I was in the eighth grade at Aptis Junior High School. It's called Aptis Middle School in San Francisco. And I was energized with expectation because the class was called Woodshop. It was the one elective we were allowed to take as students matriculating at Aptis Junior High School. Now, Aptis Middle School in San Francisco, California, I sat on the front row, and as I sat on the front row the first day of class, this was my introduction to that class. The teacher was sharing with us what we would be doing, and I'm seated on the front row. Watch what happens. The teacher is trying to make a point. He gets all up on me, as it were, and tries to lean over in order to make a point. When he did that, he he slipped and fell when he caught himself and got up. He was so embarrassed. Look what he did. He told me, move. And then with this steel-toed boot, he kicked me in my shin. Don't miss it. I'm in the eighth grade. I'm 12 years old at Aptis Junior High School in San Francisco, California. Now it's called Aptis Middle School. And this teacher, who in a real sense had power, and I at that time was powerless. This teacher had slipped and fallen. It wasn't my fault. I just happened to be in the wrong place to him at the wrong time. Look what he did to me. He decided with that steel-toed boot to kick me. He kicked me in my shin. Needless to say, I am embarrassed. Needless to say, I am ashamed. Needless to say, I find myself feeling pain, not just physically, but emotionally. Emotionally. Will you allow me to unpack it right now? I'm shamed. I am in pain physically and emotionally. And note with me, my sisters and brothers, to this day, there is a scar on my shin that I carry as evidence of the reminder of what this person with power did to me when I was in a position of powerlessness. I'm not done because to make matters worse, my sisters and brothers, don't forget even though he personally hurt me, I'm seated in a class. That meant there were other people in the class who witnessed the pain that I had experienced at the boot of this teacher that was in power. I hope you're getting where I'm going right now because not only am I in pain, but I am feeling, I am feeling public shame. And somebody came to church. I don't know you, but God already has me in your Kool-Aid. I'm calling 
calling out your flavor because if you're honest with yourself, you know something about personally being hurt and broken by someone, watch this, who you trusted enough to be in proximity to. And now, as a consequence of trusting them, you discovered that they were not worthy of your trust. It left you in a space, don't miss it, of personal pain, but wait, it gets worse because it's not just personal pain, but please don't miss this, it's public shame. It's not like you're the only one who knows what was done to you. The sad reality is other people know what happened to you and that magnifies your misery and amplifies your anguish. I'm not even done because I think I told you already that I still bear to this day. If I pulled up my pants leg, you would see the scar that is the evidence and the reminder of what took place back then. I guess I'll give it to you like this. If you're not careful, there are some things that people have put you through, and here's your shout right here, and it's not through with you. There's a scar. There is lingering evidence that what happened back then is still a part of your life right now. I'm still not coming through. I'll give it to you like this because emotionally I was so hijacked Pastor Johnson that I got up and moved when he told me to move I sat in the back of the classroom and anyone who has gone to school with me will let you know I never now to this day sit on the front row I do not sit on the front row why because of what happened back then and now here it is psychologically in order to engage in self-protection Please don't miss this. I sit all the way in the back. I'm seated in the back because of what happened back then that still influences and informs my behavior right now. I'm talking to you, aren't you? And I, because if you're not careful, you will allow what happened to you back then uh, to cause you to engage in self-protective behavior. And your self-protective behavior will make you move uh, from the front to the back of life. Why? Because you don't want to expose yourself like that again. And so there I am, my sisters and brothers. And then I went from there. Please don't miss this to blaming myself. I'm blaming myself because if I had not been where I was, he wouldn't have done what he did to me. And some of us know the feeling. Don't even judge me and act funny because sometimes when what has been done wrong to us takes place, we oftentimes if we're not careful, we'll start to look at ourselves and blame ourselves for the shame that we have experienced. All of that is part of my first day at Aptus Junior High School. Now it's known as Aptus Middle School in San Francisco, California. But please don't miss this because on my way out of class, a pious little eighth grader had the nerve to say to me, go ahead and forgive him. After all, you your daddy's a preacher and I know you're a Christian. Well, understand my sisters and brothers at that point, I was not emotionally in a position to forgive. But is that not what has taken place in our nation in recent days as we have thought about where I come from in Dallas, all of the events that have gone down? You recall what happened. Both of them, John was in his own apartment late one Thursday night, September six of the year 2018 minding his business eating ice cream when all of a sudden the door to his apartment opened and Amber Geiger a police officer thinking that he was a threat in her apartment, though it was in his apartment, shot him dead, murdered him. And when she murdered him, it was then that it dawned upon her that she was in the wrong apartment. But imagine how both of them must have felt minding his business, and now he's dead. And now, one year later, the trial has taken place. She's been found guilty of murder, and we know what went down as the courtroom scene revealed an anguish, 18-year-old little brother of both them, John, still working through his own grief. And that's why I refuse to judge him because grief and loss will mess with your head, your heart, 
and your spirit so much so that all of us respond to grief and loss differently. And so you can't judge him for what he did because he's still working through that. But here is what blew my mind. And that is the focus was on the hug offered to the Amber Geiger by the brother and as well as the hug offered by the judge. But no one has talked much about what Mama John said because Mama John, when she was interviewed by the media, she did not offer a hug to Amber Geiger, but she offered an indictment on the Dallas policing system. Check out what Mama Geiger said. Check out what Mama John said. Mama John said what my son did was something that was on his own, but Dallas, I'm about to leave and go back to St. Lucia. And when I go back to St. Lucia, y'all still got a problem here in Dallas. You have a police department that is corrupt. You have a police department that deleted evidence that covered up a crime scene. You have a police department that engaged in corruption. I'll deal with forgiveness on my own. That's between me and Almighty God. But in the meantime, you've got to deal. Watch her. She is holding Dallas accountable because the sad reality is we engage in this country all too often of expecting black people who have been wronged and victimized by white supremacy to engage in cheap grace and cheap forgiveness to use the language of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that he borrowed from Adam Clayton Powell Sr. when he went to Harlem, New York during the 1930s and learned about the black Jesus. And when he learned, he learned there's a difference between God's grace and cheap grace and forgiveness and cheap forgiveness because forgiveness ain't cheap. Forgiveness costs something. Forgiveness, my sisters and brothers, can take place when you are suffering and in pain. But forgiveness is not something that you can do cheaply. If you don't believe it, let's hang out in our passage because in our passage, we already know the context, don't we? Jesus, our hero from the hood. Jesus, the Pied Piper of the impoverished Jesus, our sable skin savior from the streets who was straight out of Nazareth, the book lets us know, has been is being lynched on a cross called Calvary, on a hill called Calvary. And the Bible lets us know it's an ugly scene. As a matter of fact, I reference for your reading pleasure and hermeneutical insights, the classic work by the late great liberation theologian Dr. James Cohn entitled The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And in this, he sets the context and understand the context. Lynchings on a cross took place as a reminder to any would-be revolutionary. This is what will happen to you if you do anything to disrupt the, the, the Pax Romana or the so-called Peace of Rome. If you mess with the authority and power of Rome, you are going to get lynched like these revolutionaries on a cross. And so understand Jesus, my sisters and brothers, he gets lynched on a cross. But do you recall how ugly that night had been? He had been betrayed by someone who was up close and personal. I hope y'all know everybody who is by your side ain't on your side. The Bible lets us know that Judas betrayed him with the kiss. Everybody kissing on you ain't in love with you. Some folk that kiss on you and get close to you, they ain't loving you. They are leeching on you. Preach, Freddie, I am. But understand, my sisters and brothers, he gets betrayed by Judas. He gets denied by Peter. Everybody else runs off from him. They ain't around him when he needs them. And then the book says he goes through a kangaroo court of injustice because the criminal justice system has often been used as a weapon of oppression to reinforce oppression. It's a weapon of social control. So mass incarceration and the proliferation of black bodies in the prisons of our country is not an accident. It's a part of public policy that has produced black bodies being locked up in prisons. Why? Because prisons are profitable. So we have prisons for profit. We have jails with bail and the money bail system keeps a lot of us in jail. 
simply because we don't have money and connections to get out of jail. So understand it's a system that has been set up. And the Bible lets us know Jesus is victimized by the system, victimized by police brutality, and now lynched. He's hanging on a cross. But look at my Savior. While hanging on the cross, my Savior does a beautiful thing in an ugly situation. Jesus brings love into a situation of hate. And here's your shout right now. Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Y'all miss your shout. Jesus, in essence, is saying, it's above me now. Y'all still didn't shout. I thought y'all would know that because y'all do keep up with pop culture, don't you? It's above me now. That's a hot subject. I know it is, but it's not original with me. I got my subject from that episode that occurred a, a few months ago. A brother was working at the front desk of a hotel. A white woman had the nerve to call and called him an effing N-word. That's what she did, an effing N-word. And then, as God would have it, she's there for a family reunion, and she needs a hotel room. And guess who's working the front desk when she comes to get a hotel room and she starts to beg oh please I need a room I'm desperate for a room and check out bruh's response he simply says it's above me now y'all miss your shout he's saying I know you've done me dirty I know you've done me wrong and now just like God you've got to come to me to get what you need and you are asking me to do something for you I need you to understand something it's above me now and that's what I came to drop in somebody's spirit God is simply saying when folk do you wrong and you think about paying them back getting them back and they ask you to forgive them and do for them you got one response it's above me now how does that thing work I'm almost done watch the text the text says Jesus says father stop right there that's your shout and you missed your shout so I gotta unpack father for you Jesus says father in the ugliness of Calvary he says father with all the hell he's going through he says father with everything that's happening to him he says Father, watch this. That means you can have divine presence in the midst of painful injustice. I'm going to do that one more time because that's a shout right there. God is with you regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what's happening to you. God is with you, so it's above me now. How how can that work? I'll see if I can help y'all. Joseph, would you illustrate this for the people? Joseph says, yo, Freddie, I'd be glad to testify. Well, what you your testimony. Well, you know my brothers did me dirty because I made the mistake of sharing my big dreams with my brothers, and you can't share your big dreams with everybody. If you share your big vision with small people, they're going to try to cut you down to their small size. And so you know what they did? Those brothers sold me into slavery. Not others, but my brothers sold me into slavery. I'm enslaved. And of course, I end up at Potiphar's house. At Potiphar's house the Bible says in chapter 39 repeatedly these words I drop in your spirit it's your shout here it comes he's sold into slavery ends up at Potiphar's house he's enslaved here's your shout but the text says but the Lord was with Joseph okay all right, I'm talking fast. I'm going to slow my roll and let y'all know what the text says. The text says he is thrown into slavery. But when you read chapter 39, repeatedly it says in spite of what was going down with Joseph, here's the text, but the Lord was with Joseph. Am I talking that fast? I'm going to slow my roll and give it to y'all where you can get your shout on. He's thrown into slavery, but the Lord was with Joseph. Okay, I'm still talking fast. He's thrown into slavery, but 
I've been coming here 28 years. You should be anticipating the shout right now because the word but is a conjunction. I ain't smart like Jay Allen in my class, so I didn't always know what a conjunction was. But one Saturday morning, I got the word, Tiff. The word is conjunction, junction, what's your function? And the function of a conjunction connects what's before with what's after. And if it is an adversative conjunction like but, yet, however, how be it, it means whatever's on the front side is about to get overruled by what's on the back side. And so the text says Joseph is thrown into slavery, but, wait, the Lord. That's all you need right there is but the Lord. And some of y'all have a but the Lord testimony because folk did you wrong, but the Lord. Folk messed over you, but the Lord. You got sick in your body, but the Lord. Is there a but the Lord testimony in the house who can simply say, I know what they did to me, but the Lord. Okay, 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 okay. But the Lord was, here's your shout, with. There it is. The Lord was with Joseph. And, and aren't you glad about that? Because the Lord is with Joseph in slavery. And Tupac Shakur would say he became a rose out of concrete. That meant that the concrete could not stop him and block his blossoming. And that's the shout I give to some rose in the house. Forget the concrete that's been put over you. If God above you is within you, you can rise above that concrete. But the Lord was with Joseph. And he was with Joseph so much that you know what happened? He got elevated, and that's when he became attractive to Sister Potiphar. Sister Potiphar sees him and says, hey. And so when she sees him, y'all know what happened, don't you? She decides to try to get with him, and so her, she, she got this scheme that she cooks up and has all the other servants not come to work that day, but doesn't tell Joseph. Joseph shows up for work. All the lights are out. There are Egyptian aromatherapy candles all throughout the place. Roses leading to the bath, leading to the bedroom, and then she walks out, and she has been to, what, Frederick's of Egypt to get an outfit and she steps out in that hot outfit and she tries to jump on Joseph's bones and y'all know what happened Joseph discovered in this life if you can't stand the heat of temptation run and so Joseph took off running and she hollers rape she makes up something isn't it jacked up when folk have power and they always making up stuff they will they will conjure up a lie they will act like something is the truth even though it ain't nothing but a lie. I mean, they have the power, and while they empower, they lie every time they open up their mouth. As a matter of fact, they will lie and tell a lie that they didn't lie about the lie that they told. Y'all will catch that later on. And so the Bible says she lies, hollers rape, and Joseph is thrown in prison. The text says, but the Lord was with Joseph. God is so good. God doesn't have to let, God doesn't have to stop stuff from happening to you. God can let you go through it, but while you're going through it, God can be with you in the midst of your going through it. Y'all still missing your shout. Here's the, here's the shout. The shout is, of course, Joseph gets elevated. Can I go run now? Run over to chapter 50. And Joseph says to his brothers, after his daddy dies, y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Okay, okay. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I got to shout you. Uh, I knew I was preaching for Jeffrey and Jay Allen, so I did my homework. And etymologically unpacked the word meant. The word meant... We get several words from, including, here's your shout, the word forecast. You meant it for evil, but God forecast it for good. Okay, okay. You meant it for evil, but God, there's some good words right there, had a forecast. Forecast, that's from weather. 
weather, weather, forecast. That's from weather. I'm about to shout you. Forecast is from weather. You intended evil for me, but God had a different forecast. A forecast, forecast what's on the way. A forecast says it may be cloudy right now. It may be storming right now, but the forecast says don't you give up because of how bad things are right now. This past summer, a little girl in our church had a weekend birthday party and the little girl told me that Sunday she said Pastor Haynes I might as well tell you it's my birthday today she wanted some money so I gave her some money and once I gave her the money she said Pastor God is so good I said yes he is and she's like eight years old how do you know God is so good she said because Pastor on Friday you know it stormed real bad and my parents took me to dinner on Friday in the storm and while we were in the storm I was upset because I knew that Saturday night was a sleepover and Sunday after we leave church my friends and I are going to Six Flags over Texas and I didn't want it to be storming on my birthday at Six Flags over Texas and so we're sitting at the table Friday night and my daddy says why are you looking sad and she, and she said I said I'm looking sad because it's storming outside and we having a sleepover tomorrow night and going to Six Flags after church on Sunday and his father and her father said well baby girl haven't you seen the forecast and she said daddy what forecast I thought you watched me on TV because he's a weatherman and she said you I didn't watch you tonight daddy and she said he said well dad he said well baby girl I already gave you the forecast it's gonna storm tomorrow but the good news is on Sunday the Sun comes up it's a sunny day and she said that pastor Haynes I got up and ran around that restaurant hugged my daddy I kissed my daddy it was still storming outside but I kissed my daddy because I had just gotten the forecast and I'm trying to say to somebody right now however dark it may be I got a forecast for you weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning I do have a forecast for y'all even the you shall faint and be weary young folks shall fall but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles run and not get weary walk and not think anybody seen the forecast I've got a feeling everything is gonna be all right you ain't seen nothing yet the best is yet to come okay 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 so 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 there's the divine presence Jesus says father father I'm hanging there father you didn't shout father he doesn't use the word Abba. He uses a word that also means father and mother. He uses a word that is used for mentor. He says, father, mother, mentor, symbolizing the presence of God in the anguish and the pain that he's going through. God is still right there. Okay, okay. I'll make this real plain. This is real good right here. Uh, I, I read this Jacksonville newspaper about this sister, watch this, this 77-year-old sister was driving and, and while she was driving in the rain-soaked streets of the Jacksonville, Florida, she all of a sudden is sideswiped by a car. It causes her to run off the road over into the bed of a creek. And so she got run off the road by a driver that was reckless. So somebody's recklessness left her in a ditch. She's 77 years old. She does not have a cell phone and then she can't open the door. The door is locked shut. But here comes the shout and the testimony. When she is there, what she does, she turns on the radio because she loves gospel music and she knew she was helpless and could not get out. And so she just turned on the radio tip and she played her some gospel music. I don't know what she played. Maybe she was playing what? He's been better than good to me. Maybe she went old school and began to play God is the joy and the strength of my life moves all pain, misery, and strife. I don't know what she played but I know she was playing some old she was playing some gospel music maybe she was playing every praise is due our God every word of worship with one accord every praise God our Savior God our healer God our deliverer I don't know what she was playing but I do know that she praised God and she prayed to God and her testimony is that while the car don't miss this is over in the creek that all of a 
sudden her wedding ring that she had lost that her late husband had given her, it slides out from under the seat and she can retrieve the ring. But wait, it's not even over because a card he had given her before he died also slid out and she thought she had lost both of them. She opens up the card and there is a love note from her late husband along with the hundred dollar bill. And y'all, she is there and starts praising God. Now, she's still in the ditch. She's still in the creek, but she's praising God because even though the reckless driver ran her off the road, if he had not run her off the road, she wouldn't have found what she found. And then here comes your shout. The next thing she knew behind her, a pickup truck stopped and out jumped a 26-year-old by the name of Chris Miracle. Chris Miracle gets out of the truck and then opens up the door and helps her up and then calls for a pickup truck, or calls for a tow truck to come get her car. And when they call for the tow truck to come get her car, Chris Miracle says, let me drive you where you have to go. And he does. And while driving her where she was going, they came across, here's your shout right here, the same car that her dri had driven her off the road was stopped on the side of the road because the police had stopped him. On top of that, he had a flat tire because it looked like he had gotten away, but God wouldn't let him get away because you can't do for God's people dirty. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down and wither like the green grass. Y'all didn't shout. I know why you didn't shout. I got to go back and finish that out, don't, don't I? Because when she got home, she was asked by her daughter, Mama, how'd you get out of that situation? She said, this young man came and got me named Chris Miracle. You see, I got delivered by a miracle and God is good enough to bring a miracle at just the right time. I got to keep this thing moving. Watch the text. The text makes me real hype because the text says, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Uh-oh. Father, forgive them. Oh, how do I give it to you? Father, you forgive them. Father, I can't do this right now because I'm in a lot of pain. I done been through all. I've been betrayed. I've been beaten. I've been victimized by injustice. And now they're standing around. They slap me. They scorn me. They spit on me. And Father, you forgive them because whenever you want to say it's above me now, that's when you make up your mind, God, I know they need to be forgiven and I ain't in a position to do it right now. So why don't you handle it for me? A lot of times we think that Jesus did it himself. No, Jesus is Jesus and Jesus still in his pain said, Father, you forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. I'm simply trying to say, shift the weight to your daddy and your daddy will handle their forgiveness. Okay, okay, okay. So, so you know, this sermon really has a lot of testimony in it because I can't preach what I have not, what, been through. And so, so here's the deal. This, this is the deal. Uh, earlier this year, I'm feeling kind of bitter about some stuff, and I won't go into all of that stuff. And so my daughter can tell I'm real angry uh, in Albany, and so I've been preaching 28 years, and she's 27 now. That's the trip, ain't it? And so my baby girl, 27, graduate of Howard University, the William Espers uh, School of Acting. She finished there. And so I'm visiting her in New York, and she can tell I'm angry about some stuff because my, my temper's real short. I'm short with people and all of that stuff when we go eat at the restaurant. And Albany finally said, Daddy, I can tell you're real angry, but, but never forget the story you told me about when you were real bitter over what Friendship West had done. And so I said, what are you talking about? And then it hit me. Here's the testimony. The testimony is this. Is this. Five years into my pastorate, a group got together to get rid of me at the church. And when they got together to get rid of me, I know about church hurt because they got together to get rid of me. As a matter of fact, it was the former pastor's wife, and she got together a crew to get rid of me. Yes, she did. She got together this crew. Matter of fact, filed a lawsuit on me 
and then went to a judge, had an injunction filed against me. And I ain't going to lie, that was a bitter time in my life, but it gets worse because after we won the case, we went to court and the judge handed down his verdict. Watch this with the Bible. He said, there's been talk about who owns the church. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's who owns this church. And y'all, he just went down until he got to me and said, Pastor, when you go home, read the passage where God told the prophet in Hosea chapter 5 to go back home to his people and to his ministry. And that's what I'm giving to you in the verdict. Y'all, we shouted out of that place because God gave us victory. But then I discovered that she had owned the money or she owned the bank account. And so when we tried to retrieve the money because she was the sole signatory on the account, she got away with all the money we had raised the first five years of my ministry. And three years later, watch what happened. She had the nerve to come back to the church, get an appointment with me, and sat across my desk and had the gall, the unmitigated gall to tell me she's in financial straits and said, Pastor, can the church give me a loan? You know what I said? I went Whitney Houston, hell to the no, I'm not going to give you no loan after you stole from this church. And I see y'all, I see y'all, you judging me, you judging me. But she stole from the church and now she's asking me for money and I say hell to the no and y'all no, let me tell you how good God is because I left that office that day and as God would have it, I had to take a flight. Albany was just a little one and she was going with me on this flight and here is how God delivered me. We are in one gate area and they announced that we've got to go to another gate area and so Albany said, Daddy, but I'm tired and Albany has this little cute baggage that she carries and I've got my own baggage I'm carrying and Albany doesn't feel like walking she said daddy I can't walk anymore I said all right baby what you want me to do she said daddy can you carry me and so I picked Albany up she said daddy but what about my baggage she said daddy are you strong enough to carry me and my baggage and y'all the moment that happened that's when Albany again fast forward to this year she said daddy Daddy, you told me that you can carry me and my baggage. And daddy, I'm just here to remind you that the same since you're my father and you carried me and my baggage, the good news is God is your father and God can carry you and your baggage. Father, you forgive them. You forgive them. You forgive them because Desmond Tutu says forgiveness ain't cheap. Forgiveness ain't quick. Forgiveness ain't acting like a doormat. Forgiveness is not letting people just get away so you act like nothing ever happened. But forgiveness is a decision you make to begin a process so, your, so the past does not have to get in the way of the future that God has in store for you. Oh, I'm not coming through. You know, you know, Desmond Tutu came to my class when I was working on my doctorate in ministry and Desmond Tutu told this story about Nelson Mandela. It messed us up. He said, Nelson Mandela exited prison determined not to be bitter because he said, if I left prison bitter and filled with resentment, I would move from one prison to another prison. And so Nelson Mandela, he tells this story that when Nelson Mandela during the height of apartheid was going to law school, there was a professor there that could not stand him and one day Nelson Mandela knowing the professor couldn't stand him at lunch sat right next to the professor and the professor said uh, sir don't you know that pigs and birds do not sit next to each other and Nelson Mandela said oh you're right I'll just fly away and went to another seat and then uh, he, the, the professor is livid now and the professor sees Mandela in class and says to Mandela if you had the opportunity and option to choose between a bag full of wisdom and a bag full of money what would you choose and Mandela said give me the money and he said see I would have chosen wisdom and Mandela responded yes because everyone chooses what they don't already have and that ticked the professor off anyway 
more, even more. And now they get to class and the professor is livid and hands back Nelson Mandela's paper and marks his paper idiot and gives it to Nelson Mandela and Mandela sits there. How can I respond to this? Watch the clap back. He gets up from his desk, goes to the front and tells the teacher, I'm sorry, professor. I thank you for giving me my paper. You put your name on it, but for you forgot to give me my grade. All I'm trying to say is that Mandela did not allow what the professor was doing to bring him down to their level. And here it is. Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. Don't allow them going wrong to make you go wrong. You stay right even as they are wrong because they, Martin King would say, on bad, they are blind. And they are so blind, they don't know what they do. And what they've done to you, they don't know what they're doing. And all I'm trying to say, my shout right now is whoever did you dirty, they don't know what they did. And that's why you can leave here, go to a Hallmark store, get you some thank you cards and thank all of your haters for what they did because they didn't know what they were doing. But then don't just get a thank you card. Make sure you get a, 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 a sympathy card and say, I'm sorry for your loss. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, here it is. I'm almost done. Here it is because Abedi and I, we got on the plane. It's a small, what, crop duster. And we are seated in the front. This is going to mess you up. Abedi in this seat. I'm in this seat. We're in the front. And it's only eight other people on the flight. And they're all behind us. And the, and the flight attendant says, we cannot take off because of how the plane ain't balanced right. And so we need those of you in the rows behind the first row, that's me and Ob's row, to move and get in the right place so that we can take off. We've got to balance the plane. So we need some people on this side and some folk on that side and some folk in the far back. We already have the front taken care of, but we got to have the plane balanced. And so you in the front, you stay right where you are, but we can't take off until those behind you are in the right place. We can't take off yet because the ones behind us have to be situated in a proper space because once the ones behind us are properly placed, then we can take off. And God sent me to tell somebody, God has some folk who are behind you now, but God says you can't take off in your own life until the folk behind you are in the right place. I'm done. I'll, I'll, I'll quit with this. This is, this, this, this I told you my testimony, so forgive me for bleeding all over y'all, but this has kind of helped me uh, to, to work through some stuff because I know what's going on and it blesses me about preaching here at Eastern Star. Y'all listen so well and you listen so well that, that with all the shout bombs I've dropped, you haven't shouted because you are still in your sympathy and sagacity. You are still thinking about how I got kicked as a little kid. And so you are wondering what happened to that teacher and what happened to me. Well, let me give you the shout and I'm done. The shout is, here is what went down. After class, I went to tell uh, Miss Barney. No, I didn't tell Miss Barney, but, but Miss Barney was the only black teacher at Aptus Junior High School. It's Aptus Middle School right now. And someone went and told Miss Barney that the woodshop teacher had kicked Fred Frederick Haynes. And so Miss Barney came and found me. And Miss Barney said, you come to my uh, you come to my office. We need to talk. She said, what happened? I said, so-and-so kicked me. She said, are you kidding me? And then Miss Barney took me to the principal's office to tell the principal what happened. And Miss Barney said, do you know who this young man is? The principal said, no, I don't know. This is Frederick Douglas Haynes III. He's the son of the pastor of Third Baptist Church here in San Francisco. Now, to give you more context, the zebra killings were going on, and so racial tensions were real high. My daddy had been interviewed as a social 
social justice activist. And so when they, when, when that principal found out that my daddy is Frederick Douglass Haynes Jr., do you know that principal got scared? He said, please do not tell your father on us. Do not tell your father what happened to you. And so I said, so you want me to go home with my shin all bruised up and not tell my daddy what happened? And Miss Barney chimed in, yeah, you want to keep his daddy out of this? Well, you got some stuff you need to get done before tomorrow. May I tell y'all what happened by tomorrow? I got back tomorrow, and when I got back the next day, here's the shout. The teacher that kicked me had been moved. Not only did he get moved, but before the year ended, he got fired and lost his job. But that ain't even the shout. The shout is they put another teacher in that room, and that teacher in that room was always trying to encourage me. I guess they found out who my father was, and that teacher was always trying to be nice to me. I got an A in that class. When I got an A in that class, it dawned on me. The first day of the class, I was kicked. The last day of the class, I'm the A student who has the best grade in the class. I can't even stop right there because when I graduated from Aptis the very next year, here's your shout right here. They had an honors assembly, and in that honors assembly, I was giving all of these honors, and when I was given those honors, guess how good God is? The teacher that kicked me was there in the assembly that day with his own child, and that teacher had to watch me go up on stage, get all of my awards, and y'all know I could not resist. I went to Miss Barney and said, you see him right there? And she said, yes, I do. Now you walk with me with your awards because we're going to walk right by him, and I want you when we walk right by him, don't look at him, just throw your awards up and keep it moving. And all I'm trying to let y'all know, we serve a mighty good God. And when folk do you dirty and folk do you wrong, God has the last word. And since God has the last word and your heart is broken, just testify when they come for you. It's above me now. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? God, you know who's here. And God, you kind of pushed me into preaching this. I didn't plan on it. But you knew who would be here. You know who battles with bitterness. You know who is wrestling with resentment because of how they've been mistreated, how they've been done wrong. And so right now, God, I pray that you will remind everyone in this space that you are strong enough to carry us and our baggage. And right now, oh God, help us to not be pressured into cheap forgiveness, but instead use us in love, the same love that set us free. Use us, oh God, to exact forgiveness that blesses others while setting us free. Help us, O oh God, not to hold others hostage with our resentment. But I pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, that even now, you are setting us free from what they did to us. And in the name of Jesus, set us free so we, O oh God, can have the power to also release them. You are God. You are able to carry us and our baggage. And so we give it to you testifying glory glory hallelujah since i laid my burdens down in jesus name amen